So, all right, let's get going. My name is Debbie Mikutsky. I am the coordinator for Graduate Student Legal Aid. Welcome to the Grad Alting Workshop. We are here to talk about paraphrasing, citations, and staying out of trouble, right? <laughs> Sound good? Um, but let me first talk a little bit about legal aid in case you don't know. Legal aid, yes, we have a, an attorney on our staff who helps with all kinds of things. The number one reason students come see him is tenant landlord problems. Yeah, sometimes it's because the tenant didn't read the lease, and but more often it's because the landlord is not a terrific landlord. So but we help students handle those messes. Um, we have advocates on staff who help students who've been charged by the university. Um, I'm a notary, so I do that. And of course we have these workshops. Um, I should also mention we have immigration consultations with an immigration attorney for our international students. Um, she meets with students one day a month. So any questions about any of that? Okay. I think that let's move on to our speaker. So the reason we're here, one of the things that our office does, like I just mentioned, is we support, um, advise students who've been charged by the university um, with a violation against the code of conduct or the code of academic integrity. And one of the main reasons students end up talking with us is because they have plagiarized. Sometimes it's accidental plagiarism and sometimes it's not. Um, but in either case, we help students navigate that process um, with the Office of Student Conduct. It's a very emotional time and students are often just, you know, they just need to help in understanding what their options are. And, um, you know, it's, it's nice to have some support when you're going through that. So, over the many, many past years, we have always relied on Linda McCree, our speaker today. Um, Dr. McCree is the with the Graduate School. She's also the director of the Writing Center. And uh, she's going to talk with all of us today about how to stay out of trouble and how to avoid that accidental plagiarism. So if you, I just will one more plug for us. If you know of anyone who gets charged by the university, suggest that they go to our office because no one should have to go through that alone. Um, and also suggest that they go to the Graduate School Writing Center. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Thank you. Um, thanks everybody for joining today. As I said, I'm Linda McCree. I'm the director of the Graduate School Writing Center. I put some, uh, of our information about the writing center um, back on the sign-in table of the turtle. Um, the, everybody know about the writing center? Excellent, wonderful. So um, unfortunately, I hope to never see you again in this context. I actually see all the students, the graduate students who have been um, charged with plagiarism, who've been found to have committed plagiarism um, through the Office of Student Conduct. So I know all the mistakes that get made. Hopefully I'll never see you in that situation again, uh, or uh, not again, I'll never see you in that situation. But as Debbie said, we're also definitely the place to come and ask questions before when you have questions about any of your writing, certainly, um, but also uh, specifically about any kind of academic integrity questions. So please feel free to ask questions as you have them. Don't I, I hope I left plenty of time at the end too, but if you have a question to ask, um, you're not interrupting, you're engaging. Um, and um, and hopefully this, if, so if any of this doesn't make sense, please just ask. So I'm gonna start by talking just a little bit about what do we mean about academic integrity? I'm going to start with the basics. Um, actually, the, the uh, content that's on the next handful of slides is the same as is on one of the handouts back there on the legal aid table because um, Zach Mundy, the lawyer in legal aid, and I put this together together. So if you have looked at it, um, it's also available on uh, the Writing Center's website. So what is academic integrity? So uh, but, right, um, as a graduate student, you really joined an academic community, right? And the point of academic integrity is that you are um, 
uh, ethically representing your work and your use of someone else's work, right? That's the simple overarching idea, right? The goal for everyone in, in graduate school and in school in general, right, is building knowledge. Um, and as you're doing that, you're always looking at someone else's work, and especially in graduate school, right? you're building on other people's work. And so um, the, the um, idea around academic integrity is really that it's a communal value um, not just uh, a rule, um, and that there's a distinction there um, that maybe uh, doesn't seem important, but I think it is. Um, so the Code of Academic Integrity at Maryland talks about a number of things, fabrication, making up your data, cheating, looking at someone else's test while you're taking it, um, facilitating academic dishonesty, letting someone else look at your paper while, so they can cheat, um, plagiarism and self-plagiarism. So I'm only going to talk about those last two things, plagiarism and self-plagiarism, um, and, and dig a little bit more deeply into those. And again, whatever kinds of questions. So what's plagiarism? Pretty straightforward, except it's not, right? Plagiarism is any time that you're using someone else's words and ideas without giving them credit, right? Um, it's pre yeah, presenting the words or others of an idea, wherever that came from, whether that's from a website, and that's a mistake I see a lot. People think, oh, it's a website, it's freely available, it's no one's ideas, I don't need to credit it. Um, from an article, um, from a classmate, um, and presenting it as your own. So that happens though in a couple of ways. It happens either when you just don't cite anything at all, you make no acknowledgement that, that the information is not from your own head. Or it also happens when you don't acknowledge it correctly. So we're going to dig a little more into the not acknowledging it correctly. Um, so how do you avoid plagiarism? All sorts of ways. Um, the big picture things are give yourself enough time. The students that I see um, who have been uh, found to have uh, um, committed plagiarism almost always tell me that they waited until the last minute or till relatively uh, late in the uh, assignment schedule to do the work. Um, make sure you're reading things carefully and really reading them, not skimming them, not just cutting and pasting um, and keep track of where things came from. And if you're reading a lot of things and I'm definitely guilty of this myself at times, if you're reading a lot of things, it's easy to be like, oh yeah, I got that idea from that article, that article by those guys. I'll, I'll fill in that detail later. But then once you're further into an assignment, it's harder to remember all those details. So, um, the, all, so the way to avoid plagiarism is to always cite things appropriately. Um, but some of the ways to make sure that you're doing that are to make sure that you're leaving yourself enough time. And the basic rule about plagiarism is, I think in some ways it's pretty simple. If the idea came from somewhere else, you need to cite it. If the words came from somewhere else, you need to cite it and you need to make it clear to whoever's reading your work that the words are also not yours, right? Because here's my assumption. I see a sentence and it's a sentence and you have a citation at the end of it. Okay, that says to me, okay, you got that idea from whatever you're citing, but the words are yours. And what I see students do frequently is that in fact, the words also were cut and pasted into the article. And students will say, but I cited it. And I'm like, yes, you did. But your reader in, in the in a American Western academic context, your reader assumes any words that aren't in quotation marks are your words. If you cite it, that tells me the ideas came from somewhere, but you need to make it clear where the words came from too. So I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit. Um, uh, so oh, I think I reversed my ideas here, right? Preventive things, start early. Ask your citation, ask your citation, ask your instructor what they expect about a citation style, right? So ask. If it's not clear on the, if you are told you need to be reading something for an assignment, then ask about the citation style. If your advisor tells you, I don't care, use whatever one you're used to, and I hear that a lot, then you ask, which one do you use? Which one do you prefer? make sure you know which one you're using um, because frequently in faculty forget that you need to learn this somewhere along the way. And if you don't know how to use a style, then you want to make sure that you're using one. 
Um, never, ever, ever cut and paste things into a paper. That's just the, one of the easiest ways to make sure you don't plagiarize is never just use that cut and paste feature. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how to avoid that. It's very tempting. You can cut and paste things, paste things into notes, but never let them go all the way to your paper. And then ask for help, right? And so uh, that's what you're doing, right? So how do you do this proper citation thing? Okay, so a citation, and I'm gonna um, break this down really uh, to all the basics. A citation is a signal to whoever's reading your paper that the ideas came from somewhere else, right? So um, that whatever you're sharing came from somewhere else. Again, in academic writing, we're always building on someone else's ideas. So the expectation is you're gonna have citations unless you've been told, don't, you know, this assignment should be done without reference to anything else, then you should have citations in it. And that's expected. Um, and usually it includes, in everybody's style, it includes some way in the body of the text. So in your writing, some way to indicate this is an idea came from someplace. And then you have some kind of notes at the end, whether those are called references or bibliography or endnotes or whatever the style calls for. So citations have two parts, something in the text and what it looks like in the text varies across style. And we'll look at a few and then something at the end. Um, and you need a way to clearly distinguish though what you, what's your ideas from anybody else. So here are some examples, I'm trying to like make sure I'm on this thing. So here's an example, and this is from faculty here at Maryland, right? So um, here's the reference, uh, Professor Dow in sociology. Here's someone's reference to her work, right? Multiple mothering ideologies have been identified in the literature, including intensive mothering, please, uh, competitive mothering, Toronto, combative mothering, more in Abbott, and integrated motherhood. So these, yes, uh, those are citations, right? These, so the thing too, a thing, yeah, the technical uh, Yeah, can't turn it on. So right, these are citations. And if this is really, really basic, I'm, I'll tell you why I'm being, these are the citations. And then, right, we see, this one, for example, I didn't ever put all of them, right? So here's the reference, that's what it's to. So your paper would have both this in-text citation and a reference at the end. This is an APA style used by most social science, most social science fields, not everybody, but that, so that's one way of doing it. All right, here's another example. Um, and this may be a little harder for you all to see. This is from Cybersecurity Journal. And if we're reading this, the USA is in the midst of its most resounding policy shift on cyber conflict with the profound implications for national security and the future of the internet. A vision statement by the US Cyber Command and the Cyber Strategy from the US Department of Defense, DOD, conclude that since US cyber forces are, quote, in quote, persistent engagement with adversaries, then it is imperative for the military to defend forward, to continuously contest adversaries, to limit the terrain over which the enemy can gain influence or control. And then there's this thing here, one, um, the commander of U.S. Cyber Command argues, quote, we must take this fight to the enemy just as we do in other aspects of conflict, and quote, operating, quote, against our enemies or on the virtual territory, and quote, because the military, quote, cannot be successful if limited to the DOD networks. Okay, there's a lot in there. So first of all, you see these things, one, two, three, three to five, four, six. Those are the citations. Anybody in engineering? This is IEEE style, right? I'm pointing this out with those big red circles because I once helped a student who said I had no idea those were the citations. I thought they were numbering sentences. And I don't point that out because to make fun of that student, but if it's not familiar, that, you know, that makes sense, right? They're numbered, right? So in some fields, in, in, in uh, IEEE, this one is, whoops, Right here, it's big, author name, year. In IEEE, it's little, we just as little interruption as possible. But the other thing that we saw in here is that there are direct quotations. Actually, really rare in, I, in engineering, you don't see a lot of direct quotations. Here, they're, they're because they're referring very directly to something somebody said and really building the argument on that. You'll see all these quotation marks, right? So we know when they say, um, no, I have to go back, right? When they say, uh, conclude that since US cyber forces are, quote, in persistent engagement, that that is language from the source, right? Very directly. Um, the, the rest of the sentence is the author's, this author's 
own words, but that's the citation. Questions about any of that? Makes sense, right? Um, again, why do we cite sources? Again, in an American context, there's just this expectation. Yes, you're always building on knowledge, but, um, but you're also expected to acknowledge that, right? The idea that um, intellectual property is property. It's something owned, very American idea, something we own and therefore something you can't just use without my permission or at least my acknowledging that it's mine, right? Um, so citations demonstrate that you've done your research and that you're acknowledging it. So there's kind of two parts to that. There's both the kind of ethical part of acknowledging, saying this is where it came from. It's also something about your credibility though, right? It's you saying, here's what I'm building on. These are the sources I looked at to make my argument. They're not just yanked off the internet by, you know, they're not Wikipedia. They're, they're actual sources that have merit, right? So there's both an element of you developing your own credibility and you being ethical. Um, showing that you did your research, giving credit where it's due and creating credibility. Sorry, <laughs> can't like. And then I talked a little bit about a citation style already, right? We saw APA, IEEE. So a, a citation style is just that. Different fields have different ways of doing the mechanics of citation. They all do something in text, something at the end. They all... Um, they all have an expectation that if the words are directly from someplace else, then they go in quotation marks. Um, but then they're kind of doing other work, right? So different disciplines use different styles for different reasons. Um, I, I, I like to think that IEEE, the one that was just like, here's a number, as little as they want, as little interruption in the text as possible, right? There's lots of citations. We're building on lots of other studies. You go look at them on your own time. We're just, we, we are, they're common enough, et cetera, et cetera. Um, APA, where you always see the author's name and the year, I think the value there is you need to give credit where it's due and how recent it is really matters, right? I come from English, MLA uses an author's last name and a page number in a specific text. Why? Because in MLA, which is um, English and fields that use MLA are very much about the text, right? About the specifics of the text. Um, then you want to be able to go back and look very specifically at it, right? When if I quote Shakespeare, I give you what, um, I don't give you a page number, I give you what act and scene and line, right? So as specific as possible. So different styles just really have different, um, different priorities in what they want you to consider, but they all have something in text, something at the end. Um, and then again, when to include the citation every time you refer to the ideas of someone else in your work, right? That might be when it's an idea you learned from a source. It might be when you summarize something that you read. It might be a direct quotation. And again, a note in the text and something at the end. Now, this time when all of you are thinking, or at least one of you is, but everything I read came from somewhere, right? I wish I had an original thought at some point in my life. It seems like that's not possible in the 21st century. So what does that mean? So what do you do? Where is the, anybody want to like give me an example? Where's the line of a, yes, I learned it somewhere, but I don't really think it needs to be cited. You want to give me an example? It's in your own words, sure, but it's an idea from somewhere. So what's the idea from somewhere? Okay, but if you're really kind of moving the idea forward and, and offering it like in some new way, yeah, okay. Anything else? What if it's just a reference to an idea? How do you know if you need a citation or not? Add it to common knowledge. Common knowledge. And what are you saying? Adding your own ideas. Adding your own ideas, right? Yeah. So, so still kind of like you still want to acknowledge, even if you're adding your own ideas, you're acknowledging it. But then there's this common knowledge. When I used to teach freshmen uh, 15 years ago, Freshman used to say, if, if it's in five books, that's common knowledge. Okay, what five books, right? Of course, and you, you can obviously find something in five different places. So that's not a great rule. So there's no like easy test, right? But it is, here's, here's what I, um, I always recommend. If it's something everyone in your field knows, right? It's that throw out a term that everyone in your field knows. Go ahead, just say it out loud, all of you at once. 
it'll be different terms. What's a field everybody in your field knows? DNA. DNA. Okay, right. You don't have to, you don't need to, um, you don't need to acknowledge where you learned about DNA, unless you just learned about it yesterday from a really interesting source, right? Um, what else? Personality theories. Okay, all right. So very commonly known for in your field. What was your term? Okay, all right. We don't need to give Einstein any more credit than he gets. Right, <laughs> right. Yes, right. So, so that kind of if it's really well known in your field, then you don't need to cite it anymore. But if you if you remember reading it relatively recently, like that's if you can put if you can put your finger on where you learned it then you learned it someplace pretty recently. And so sometimes that is gonna be DNA, right? I'd have to personally go look up exactly what the, you know, an explanation of DNA, right? And so if I were writing about that and I really needed to write an explanation, then I would cite that, right? Um, not just assume. So there, so there's, yes, there's common knowledge and that's why papers aren't just a, a, a citation every single word, right? There's common phrases, but um, that's a good rule. If you can put your finger on where you learned it, then it needs to be cited. All right. Um, and then the other thing is students, it's right, I'm just putting it in my own words. If I put it in my own words, and again, my precious freshman used to say, well, as long as there's not five words in a row that are exactly the same, or you're laughing about this, good, uh, <laughs> right? If, as long as like, I never have a chain of five words, and eh, it's also not their easy rule. So sometimes this is incredibly hard, right? So first of all, again, even if you put it in your own words, if it came from somewhere, if the idea came from somewhere, you need to cite where the idea came from. And then putting it in your own words, you really have to be doing something beyond just changing it from um, uh, uh, charged. You know, you can't just change the verbs around right? That's not good enough. That's not really putting it in your own word, right? So not enough to just change the words of the text. You have to cite the ideas and then put the ideas into your own words or quote them directly if that's the thing that happens in your field using quotation marks, right? Uh, again, in some fields, it's really rare to use um, quotation marks. I know it, for instance, in engineering, it's pretty rare. Um, so well, you also want to know what those kind of expectations are. Questions so far? Maybe you're going to tell me time because I don't have a watch or anything. Uh, all right. So why do we care about plagiarism so much? This is why. No, not really. Um, anybody, this, this is getting old. Anybody know why this is, uh, why we've paired these women here in this instance? Uh, it's getting a little old. I'll have to swap this slide out. Well, there's a famous incident when um, President when Trump was running for president that on the very public stage of the Republican um, convention, um, it's very common that, uh, his, that the wife of the candidate gives a talk, Melania Trump gave a talk, um, and very quickly people said, entire sentences out of Melania Trump's talk had come from a talk that um, Michelle Obama had given previously. Now, why is that such a bad thing? Well, the, the Trump campaign said, come on, she was talking about value. She was talking about family. There's only so many ways to say, you know, to say things about, about commonly held American values. It's what Melania Trump felt. So it's not really plagiarism. And people who had worked for Michelle Obama said exact sentences. Should there were exact sentences. Two, I think it was two exact sentences. So this happens pretty routinely every couple of, I don't know, months maybe in, in American politics, right? Because arguably there are only so many ways to say uh, things about values and family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but really why does this, so I don't care so much about uh, uh, Obama and Trump as I do about this article. So the article, which is hot linked if you look at these slides from Vox had a really interesting point, right? The concept of plagiarism is modern and American. All right, the concept of plagiarism, as we understand it, just didn't exist in ancient cultures. Um, below the New Testament is all kind of retelling the Old Testament. Think about that later. Um, societies in which knowledge came from divine revelation, an author, if you will, didn't value individual ownership of ideas as we do in modern Western civilization. Right, so we just kind of don't. We didn't care about this for centuries of written texts. Um, 
uh, Don Quixote. There, there are like 400 versions of Don Quixote after it was written in uh, and published in Spain. There were copyright laws. Who cares? You can take Don Quixote and make him do anything um, without paying Cervantes anything. Uh, but as we've shifted, uh, we care again about this concept of intellectual property. So here is this is a um, uh, this is a, an image from the Oxford English Dictionary where that traces like where do phrases come from? Where did they? Where, when did we start using them? So intellectual property, right, defined as uh, things like patents, trademarks, copyright material, the product of invention or creativity doesn't exist in tangible form, right? All ideas are um, intellectual property. And we really start to see that in the U.S. in around the middle of the 19th century, right? So here's one of the first cases where um, we talk about intellectual property, the labors of the mind, right? Before that, property was your house, your dog, your, um, your uh, uh, not bulldozer in 1845, Plow, that was a big word I was looking for, your plow. And then increasingly we start to think, no, things that I've created with my mind are also things that I own. Obviously that starts with books and things that are printed, but then becomes um, a, a wider range of other things. And we hear about intellectual property arguments all the time, right? Songs, movies, um, all sorts of things, right? So that's where it comes from, a very Western, very American uh, idea. But uh, I'm not here to argue the um, I'm not here to argue the value of that idea. We can have that discussion later. Um, so, good citation. That's where it comes from. Whatever responsibility, however you feel about it, um, it being at the university, you've agreed to academic integrity as we've rolled it out. And so, how do you make sure that you're you're doing things? And good citation isn't just avoiding plagiarism, right? So again. It's acknowledging words and ideas because we're building on those, not just because not just because it's a rule, but because you want to demonstrate the way that your work is building on someone else's work. Again, it's establishing credibility um, and it's giving your reader a way to do their own intellectual work, right? And hopefully some of you have done this already. You read something and you think, oh, wait, that's interesting. And you follow that source. The librarians have a word for that. It's citation chaining. And it's the best way to find out more about your, um, about a topic, I think, right? How did, how, where does this idea come from? I wanna go see the original or these are similar ideas or who else quoted this later? Um, so all of that, that really has to do with being a well-established academic. All right, but let's look at the nuts and bolts of how to cite. Um, again, why you're communicating how you're in conversation with the source, right? And that's a good word to keep in mind. You're in conversation with the source, not just they're talking at you, cut and paste, not just they're talking through you, cut and paste, right? But you actually are somehow in conversation with them. You're synthesizing what they've said, what the, the source has said into your own work, right? And really kind of using someone's ideas to move your ideas forward in some way, right? So again, your reader, whoever that is, whether it's an instructor, whether it's an, a journal article, a journal editor later, whether it's your dissertation committee at some point, your readers really expect to hear what you have to say about something even on a relatively uh, uh, early assignment in, uh, in an early class, right? You're asked to summarize an article. I know for those of you in social science or humanities, they're really common uh, first assignment, like read this article and summarize it. And even that summary, even though that's all about someone else's words, it's really the instructor wants to see how did you make sense of this? How are you synthesizing this knowledge, right? So it's never about, I, I need to know what they said for the sake of that. I need to know what they said for the sake of understanding what you get, right? Um, so your reader recognizes you're joining that academic conversation, but always really has come to your work to know what you are adding, what you have to say, what your perspective is, even if that's a simple summary assignment in a, in a class, right? So you're providing, um, you, so you need to be providing that, right? Not just the references, but really how are you using it? Um, uh, and then you're, you're again, communicating, you're in conversation with that source, right? When the reader sees a citation, that's an indication, okay, idea comes from somewhere else, but they're still expecting your words and your kind of take on the idea, right? And then um, 
So the other thing you want to be as concise as possible with that other source and offer an honest reflection, an honest paraphrase, an honest summary, um, and then clearly indicate where your ideas are, where, where you're building on them, moving forward from them. Um, can't see that small screen. Um, and I think an important thing about good scholarship that's also about good citation is don't ever just let the citations do the work for you. Don't just think, okay, that's a great idea. Oh, that's a really interesting idea. I'm putting that here. And then I'm expecting that whoever's reading my work just gets why I put it there, right? That's not great scholarship. Even if you've done the citations correctly, that's not good scholarship, right? You really want to not just let someone else's words speak for you, but really demonstrate why you're using that, how it's built, how you're building on it, why it's important, et cetera. All right, and then let's talk about really lots of ways to think about it. So we said paraphrase, summary, quotation, but really we could be a lot more kind of granular about what any of that looks like. And we'll look some, at some examples. So. Lots of different ways for to use sources in your work. And you don't need to memorize these ideas in any way, shape, or form, but you might just be giving the gist of an idea, right? Which means you're kind of reflecting, mentioning the big, broad idea, right? You might be using a mention. So including the reference, like as, you know, as has frequently been said about something, and then you put the you put a set of sources in uh, in in uh, in the in text citation. I'm going to give you examples of all these. Maybe it's just the citation only. That's kind of what we saw in the IEEE example. Maybe again, you are paraphrasing. You do want to get at a specific idea, so you're paraphrasing a couple of sentences, uh, maybe as much as a paragraph. Or again, maybe you do want exactly what they said, what, what was in the original. So you do want that direct quotation. So that's what we saw in that IEEE example. We wanted to know exactly what the source from the Department of Defense said. So we used a direct quotation. So I'm going to give you examples of all these. So here's a gist, right? We, this is the example we already saw. Multiple mothering ideologies have been identified in the literature, including intensive mothering. That's the gist, the main idea of the Hayes, 1996. They were talking about this thing called intensive mothering. Competitive mothering, that's the gist of what the Toronto 20, 2001 was about. Combative mothering uh, and integrated motherhood. So there's a gist, right? Just here's the main idea of what their research was about. Here's a mention. Um, Stone and Williams each provided a nuanced analysis of how dominant cultural and structural forces in the workplace are in tension with those in the family often favoring male workers and constraining women's choices, um, right? So kind of they're mentioning them here. And then also, oh wait, so there's two things going on here, right? The mention, right? Here's, here's their big ideas, but then also just the citation only in here. Um, oh, I had that all animated, sorry, uh, right? Mentions, mentions, and then citation only. I knew I had it in. Um, so you see the difference, right? Kind of really reflecting what they've said versus like, these, these people also talked about that, right? And so that these people often talked about this, right? This is very much, look, here's the credibility of my research. I've read all these people. I know what they're saying. I'm drawing out Stone and Williams as a focal point, but other people have talked about this. And I know that, see, I'm a good scholar. Um, citation only, that's very much what we have in, um, in this example. Children are exposed pre uh, prenatally and in early childhood to multiple environmental stressors that can adversely affect their cognitive abilities, academic performance, and consequent um, educational trajectories, adult health, wealth, and social status. And so there again, this is a footnote version instead, but again, we get that only the citation, right? And so this is the citation to, whoops, um, sorry. This is, the, this is where this paragraph comes from. For the first one and the second one, here it is, right? So there are the citations. Right, one and two, and it's just a very broad, very, it's not even kind of the idea, the big broad idea is based on someone else's work. So it's kind of even less, um, even more broad than, um, than, than the gist, right? It's, 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 especially in this case where it's reflecting two. Um, Can I ask a quick question yes, about this? Sure. You have that yep. Why do you include the first name there at the bottom in this instance, but not previously? I can't see the whole thing. Devin C. Payne. The name Devin? Oh, yeah, Devin that. C. Maybe I do that. That's a good question. Um, I'm guessing that 
Okay, yeah, I'm guessing that I cut and pasted that from from the way I, I, I didn't make these this year, so you're testing my memory. Um, but that's a good question. Um, it also may be that I I usually pull things from campus authors, so I may have put their name that way. But that's a good, yeah, right. I'm glad you pointed out. Because typically it would be Payne Sturges, comma, Devin C at all. I don't know why I did that. Go back and look. That's a good question. Um, other questions? Um, I want to sure. slide. So, like, is it funny if you just do the mentions? I believe in the yeah. yeah. Is it funny if you just do the mentions and not the citation? Yeah, yeah, sure, right. I mean, the um, right. So this is just a, this is an exception, right? So the mentions are one thing, right? Like I'm I'm saying like here's an important scholar talking about this. Here's an important scholar talking about this. I mean, you can also only have the citations, right? I mean, we can imagine a version of that sentence. That instead says um, nuanced analysis of how dominant culture and structural. Blah, blah, blah. Thanks. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Or even I mean, my 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 assumption about the way that this paragraph works is that the um, the the mentions are a little bit more about right each provided a nuanced analysis of how dominant cultural and structural forces in the workplace are in tension with those of the family. And that perhaps the often favoring male workers and constraining women's choices, that that part of the sentence is probably more the focus of these. Okay, no, but then, uh, what if the student just mentions uh, only does the mention and not the title? Yeah, yeah, right. No, I'm saying it's serving two different purposes okay. in the paragraph. And yes, you could do it in different ways. Uh, so, citation, citation is supposed to be of an alphabetical order, right in here. Or can I choose the year of publication first instead of the alphabet? Doesn't that depend on which? Um, like yeah, yeah. So this is the APA, and um, uh, that's an interesting question, right? So they, my guess, this is not something I wrote. Um, something, Professor Dower. Um, my guess is that the, um, and I think this is old APA to be honest too, right? But it's alphabetical: Blair, Person, Stone, Williams. I guess is that I think actually new. Um, you might other other styles might make it year the order be the year. That's going to be more about. That's going to be the kind of thing that's expected and you should know it, but it's never going to get you in trouble if you do it wrong. Right? It's never going to be a, a plagiarism issue if you do it wrong. But that's what you're asking, right? Why that order? Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I think the order here, I think, is alphabetical. Um, for some, it might be uh, by year instead. Right. I just heard you reference like old APA mm -hmm. and new APA. Mm -hmm. like, how do we know rollouts of those? Yeah. Oh, that's usually a ton of noise in your department. Yeah. You, you would, I mean, new APA is not that new anymore. <laughs> I think it happened before the pandemic. And so everything before the pandemic is kind of erased in my brain. But um, yeah, you it's it'd be big noise. And or and journals will often say, like, we're expecting you to use the you know latest version of whatever. Yeah. Other questions? And also, what did we find if you just use the mentions in like the expectation is you're doing APS that reference? Reference to citations, and is this fine if you just do the mentions in that case? Because the thing is, I'm actually a first grader right now, and I'm still getting used to the different yeah. methods because I'm just used to APA. Right, right. In my course. So again, it's very much, um, yeah, it's very, it's very much the just the way that she wanted to structure this information. Right. right. There's nothing, nothing about this sentence. And the fact that she's using both mentions and um, and citations only is is required. So yes, you could absolutely. I, as I was saying before, like I, I'm I'm pretty sure that the point is that like yeah, up to here is where it's really being reflected here, and that this the favored male workers constraining women's choices is much more this kind of citation. She could have done it the other way too. It could have been like Stone and Williams each provided blah blah blah. While um, Blair Lloyd, 2003, and Gersa, 1985, often favored male workers, while Stone talks about women, right? So, yes, it can be whatever you're saying. Um, there's no rule about when you use mentions or anything. It's just a way to think about, like, it's not just about paraphrasing. There's all sorts of ways to do it. All right, we did this one. Did that. 
Okay, so um, let's actually look at kind of what this looks like in someone's text. So here is an original sentence um, from an article called uh, Transitions Combat Veterans as College Students. Here's the sentence. The focus of our study, Ackerman, DeRomeo, and Mitchell's study, the focus of our study was the transition that combat veterans make when they become college students. For many with whom we spoke, that was the most difficult transition at all. So obviously that's from a whole article. It's a, you know, several pages long, not two sentences, but there's the original. And here's how it's, here's someone using it. Um, this is not someone, this is the dean of the College of Education. Um, Ackerman, DeRomeo, and Garza Mitchell, 2009, found that student veterans listed starting college as the most difficult transition out of the military they experienced. And then there's another part. Yet, according to Cook and Kim, only 22% of schools provide veteran-specific transition support. All right, so let's look at how closely. These are in, in one sentence, she's, she's quoting two different texts, and let's look again. So how does this line up, right? The focus of our study was the transition that combat veterans make when they become college students. For many with whom we spoke, this was the most important transition at all. So this is really a paraphrase, right? Um, Dean Griffin and, and her co-author um, have really focused in on these couple of sentences. They right? found that student veterans listed starting college as the most difficult transition out of the military they had experienced, right? We can see really clearly how this came from these couple of sentences. And at the same time, we can see how it's in their own words, right? Yes, they repeated words. They have to be talking about veterans. They repeated the word veterans. They're talking about students. Of course, they repeated the word students. They talked about students leaving college or starting college. So of course, they've said the word college. They have repeated the word transition, right? So it's fine that you're using the kind of pivotal language, but they've also clearly put it in their own words. Questions about that? But a very good of how that works. And then let's look at the other part. Here's the here's the other. Um, so my thing covered it up, right? Yet according to Cook and Kim, only 22% of school of schools provide veteran-specific transition support. So here's where that came from. Only 22% of institutions with programs and services for military personnel have developed and expedited re-enrollment processes to help students restart their academic efforts. So my goal in most, 62%, requires students who are returning from deployment to complete the standard re-enrollment process, and 16% requires students to reapply and be readmitted in order to enroll. So again, a paraphrase of a much larger section here, and in fact, probably not less time, right? So, and again, we see, right, only 22%, only 22%, and they reply, okay, of institutions, of schools, right? That That is that simple freshman mindset, if I just change the words, but it's not at the same time, right? Because then they're, then they're summarizing, right? Provide veteran-specific transition support. It's kind of a summary of all the rest. So again, it's not that you can never ever use any of the exact same language, but it really needs to be in your own. Is that clear how that's? Um, and here's direct quotation. Um, again, something you're using pretty rarely if you're not in humanities, um, but here's the work from um, William Sprossman's in um, American Studies. So here's her, uh, um, what's the direct quotation? Here it is, right? Bella, Winters, Bella Winson learned the trade from her mother, Maria Wallace, one of the six waiter carriers pictured in the photograph, not this photograph, in the 19, in 1970, Winston at age 80 contributed to the town's centennial celebration by providing one of the few extant accounts about the entrepreneurial activities of the waiter carriers. This one we see has a, um, this is footnote style. This is a Chicago footnote style. Don't ask me about it, I hate it. Um, in her, how to do it. Um, in her interview with the Orange County uh, Review, Winston shared that wings, backs, gizzards, and other innards sold for a nickel, while the more choice pieces of meat, breasts and legs, sold for a dime. With the proceeds of these sales, the women went on to purchase a better way of life for themselves and their families. As Winston put it, quote, my mother paid for this place with chicken legs. 
We first lived in a log cabin, but that burned almost 50 years ago, and we rebuilt further from the road, end quote. Um, and again, why? So we have a direct quotation. Why? Because what this person said, what Winston said, uh, Bill Winston said, is really pivotal information here, right? She's, um, Professor, um, Professor Forsyth is basing her argument on these interviews, right? So you need to you need a direct quotation when what you want to do is precisely represent the original. And again, not required in a lot of uh, in a lot of your fields with any frequency. Um, here's a here's another example. Um, uh, I'm just because it's so small for you guys to see. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can. So, um, I think yellow is the yes, the, yeah. So the yellow is the um, the yellow is the original that that this article is pulling it out of. So if you so here's what since I was here Thompson's article is saying since I was a teenager I've chemically altered the natural state of my hair. At the time I never really thought about why I did it or the extent to which that chemical would rule over me. But my dormant but my Hair story is not unique. For the vast majority of Black women, hair is not just hair. It contains emotive qualities that are linked to one's lived experience. The crux of the Black hair issue centers on three oppositional binaries, the natural, unnatural, Black, good hair, bad hair, and the authentic, inauthentic Black. Well, on the one hand, scholars in the Caribbean, Britain, and the United States speak of the importance given to the dominant beauty paradigm with privileges, quote, white slash light skin, straight hair, and what are seen to be European facial features. Quote, and then the quote is to Tate, uh, page 301. And that's the, here's the direct quote, right? On the one hand, scholars of the Caribbean, Britain, and the United States speak of the, um, like, oh, I was pulling it out, sorry. That's what I was doing, right? So that's, so the direct quotation, right? And you don't have to have a whole, you don't have to have the whole sentence to have a direct quotation. Sorry, sorry. Okay. I need a bigger, yeah. <laughs> I think I, I think the first time I put these together, we were still on Zoom, and so everybody could see what was great. Um, so what's acceptable use? A good summary with a citation, a good paraphrase with a citation, a direct quotation with a citation. The commonality there is always with a citation, right? Um, Debbie, how much time do we have? Five minutes? Five minutes? Hmm. I have a quick exercise, but maybe I maybe I'll leave that for questions. What questions? Would you rather do an exercise? Is that a question? Go ahead. Please, you can talk about self citation, uh, self plagiarism. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. um, I knew that was a question. If you're, if you're an engineer and <laughs> yeah. you 3D print things and mm -hmm. you have a process mm -hmm. and you write two different papers mm -hmm. um, and you might put these into your dissertation yeah. as papers, right. um, what is fair to What's fair? copy yeah. in terms of? Methods say right, right um, between one and the other yep. without getting into trouble. Without getting into trouble. Yep. Okay. Um, so self plagiarism. Uh, I, I, um, I, first of all, uh, students worry about it more than they need to. That's my personal opinion. I've actually never seen a self plagiarism case come through the office of student conduct. That doesn't mean they don't exist, and it doesn't mean that you should just do it. But I'll say two things. And one is that um, students will always ask, like, can, can I? Can I use my work? So being an academic is all about not only building on others' works, but building on your own work, right? So, um, so again, you want credit for what you wrote. Um, and, uh, and, and in print, we see this really obviously, right? I don't, um, I don't in this presentation, but I could find you an article of someone referencing themselves, right? Referencing their own work. And that's, that, it's not tacky. It's not self-aggrandizing, right? It's, I my work founded this, or I've done this previous work, and now I'm building on it, right? The same way you're building on someone else's work. So you see that in print. In your coursework, what's the idea? So the idea for plagiarism in general is that you don't get credit for what you didn't do in this case, right? It's the same for self-plagiarism. Can you build on work? Yes. 
moving from one class to another class, you always have to have permission from the instructor, right? So can you go to the instructor and say, last semester, I was working on a project about, I'm going to use an example. Last year, I, I, I'm an urban studies major. Last year, I was working on a project that was talking about um, uh, urban planning in Montgomery County. This semester, I want to do it about Prince George's County. There are some overlaps in terms of my analysis of the state law in Maryland. Can I use the same resources? And anybody know what the answer is likely to be? No, you think the answer is going to be no? I mean, I think two things. I probably the answer is going to be yes, but how is that work going to be different? So from a writing person's perspective, you're almost never just, you're never writing the same thing twice, right? Um, well, you're rewriting things, right? So your chances are that you're not going to be able to just cut and paste even your own work into new work and have it be good, right? You can always cut and paste things. That doesn't make it's good. The question about in your dissertation is a little bit more complicated, right? So by the time you've written your dissertation, probably lots of things have been, have had some previous existence, right? And that should be a common conversation with your committee. Um, for, in some of your fields, you'll have already published things that are in your dissertation. You may have also even published things that were written jointly and then and then it's in your dissertation. And all that is about how you acknowledge that. So that's all, there's very specific things about how that works. Um, I personally think that academics wouldn't be able to survive if they didn't upcycle their work, right? Not necessarily recite, not reuse, um, but upcycle, right? How are you referencing or changing that? that science process, right? Yes, Learning. exactly. Whoops. Yeah. Right, that you're always, yeah. Other questions? Do you have another one? Of course. Sure, I did. I dropped all of them. In your definition of plagiarism, mm -hmm. you do this. I think that the last word was written, but of course, you plagiarize figures. Are they not? Maybe my definition of written is just broader. Are they not? Okay, no, are they not in ink? I mean, are they not like, yeah. They, yes, sure, you can plagiarize figures, yes. You can also cite figures, right? So I, I think I was thinking that as opposed to can you something to fair do. use. Yeah. Um, so I could come in on fair use in a few ways, right? There are clear fair use, um, art, there's a clear fair use articulation in the guidelines about what goes in your thesis and dissertation. Um, for the most part, you are um you can you can cite of a figure, a visual, in the same way that you can cite things, that you can cite a quoted text, right? But I'll, you, I'll go back to Shakespeare, because we all know him, right? The same way I could quote that to be or not to be speech, I, you can quote someone's figure, but how extensively do you need to do it, right? So again, your work is about demonstrating your work. I'm not writing an analytical paper about Shakespeare if I just cut and paste the whole speech, right? In the same way, if you're just kind of yanking out someone's figure, putting it in there and having it do work that you're not doing, then you're not doing academic work. Is that? Sure, I see all yeah. sorts of gray areas. Wait, yeah, there's also, but there are all sorts of gray areas, I think about referencing someone's, right? I mean, so, sometimes there are, I mean, it really depends on the situation, right? Some journals are very specific. Nope, you can't. You have to get permission first. Um, other others, uh, you know, for your, um, yeah, for the most part, a journal, for instance, won't let you do it. Um, can you do it in a paper? I mean, I think often that's a conversation about with a with an instructor about how you're using that um, information. But yes, all sorts of gray areas. Fair use. I mean, fair use has all sorts of gray areas. That's why you can sample a song, but you can't sample a song, right? I mean, I think that's because intellectual property is pretty great. Other questions? For a course? For a course. Of course. I got nothing. Sorry, I actually don't know. I actually yeah. had a course where I was uh, where I actually asked the professor mm -hmm. if I could read the piece of code that I wrote for the right. course. I said, yeah, that's what we tried to okay. 
you would uh, you would feel stupid not to use it. So it's like I I'm I'm glad that it's fine with you and I can use it. Right, right, yeah. And did he? I mean, how do you normally cite code? I don't know. This is not. There's no. There's no right. Exactly. Yeah. So I think. So I think you did everything. You know, can I? Can I reuse this? Can I build on this information? Yes. Can I build on this? Yeah. And said so, yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Anything else? Number three, thank you. You're gonna shout in trouble, yeah. right? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> and I do, I'll just really quickly, if you look at these slides later, I have this example from a fun article about barbecue and kind of examples of, is this good citation or is it? And, and here's one, I'm just gonna really quickly, here's the one about, um, you know, is this a good summary? Businesses make pricing decisions thoughtfully, right? Oh, that's common knowledge. Yep, it doesn't need a citation unless you just learned it, right? Or unless you really want to give credibility to this source. Anyway, I'm just stop it. The slides are gonna go out to everyone tomorrow, along with the link to the recording. <laughs> thank you, oh, Linda, thank you. a little Perfect. something, you. because you thank always you. share your time with us. <laughs> we appreciate you. Yeah. Um, so thanks for coming today, folks. There is a lot of pizza back there. So if you want to grab a, a slice or two or three, please take that um, back with you. I'm going to bring the rest down to the grad lounge. So yeah, it's good for us to spend some time together. Um, we will have a few upcoming workshops. It'll be on Zoom. I think our last workshop will be in person. But just watch the briefing for the announcements about where we are, what we're doing, but we are always here to help you. So thanks again. Have a good week. Thank you.